Musical linguistic objects. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And I'm very pleased to thank Pavel K. for his recent donation in support of the salon. And I'd like to welcome Sal K. as my 10th patron for both the new book that I'm working on as well as for here in the salon. So thanks a million to both of you. Well, we're going to do something new here today. A while back, the publicist for Rachel Harris's new book about ayahuasca got in touch with me about doing an interview with Rachel for here in the salon. And since I'm not the best interviewer, I contacted Shauna Holm and asked her if she would be interested in doing the interview with Rachel. Long story short, Shauna was almost finished reading Rachel's book in preparation for the interview when I received the recording of Lex Pelger's interview with Rachel, the one that I posted as episode 7 of the Salon 2 series. Little did I know that the symposia team was already working on this when I asked Shauna to interview Rachel as well. Well, when I told Shauna what had happened, she was kind of disappointed because after reading Rachel's book, she was really excited about having an opportunity for the two of them to talk. So I suggested that Shauna listen to Lex's interview, and then if she thought that there were still some things that she would like to cover in a follow-up interview, that I'd be happy to podcast it. And that's what we're about to listen to right now. However, Shauna has asked that I not call this an interview, because it was really more of a conversation between two people who, well, they seem to be on track to becoming new best friends. And having been involved in many conversations about ayahuasca and other psychedelic medicines myself, I'm pleased to pass this along to you in the event that maybe you are one of our many fellow saloners that are out there on the edge of the tribe with no one nearby to talk with about these interesting substances. So, if that is a description of your own situation, well then just sit back and pretend that you are relaxing in a living room with these two interesting women and listen in on their conversation. And just to give you a better feeling of sitting in on their conversation, I'm going to begin the recording right now, just when their Skype connection was first made. Hi! Hi! How are you, Rachel? I would have dried my hair had I known we were going to look at each other. Oh, we don't have to! (laughs) No, no, it's okay. I'll get over it. Well, mine's still wet from my shower, so... That's it. (laughs) Oh, there you are. Good, good, good. Yeah, and you can clearly hear me, so we're good, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was loud. I just turned it down. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. No, no, that's okay. You don't have to whisper. <laughs> okay, all right, great, great. Yeah, I have this all kind of set up, uh, so so we're recording as we speak. I should just do a double check here and just okay, make sure. I, I did find your, you are the, you're, you do the tour to Ireland. You're the right person. I'm the right person. Yes. <laughs> yes, you, Great. you you got it, and um, okay. I love that uh, we have that connection. You know, <laughs> that is quite magical. And I must tell you, Rachel, that I read your book, and I just thought, oh my goodness, I just want to sit by the forest with this lovely woman. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't and, that be wonderful? <laughs> so, I know, I want to go on the trip with you. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness, yeah. it's, it's going to be really magical. But look, so yeah. you have, I see trees in the background. Are you in Maine? Yeah, I'm in Maine. Yeah, it's okay. a rainy day, you know, this is the normal... <laughs> spring yeah it's 40 degrees and raining oh well okay so i'm in redmond which is a a suburb of seattle and um and it's also you know rainy and i don't know if you (laughs) probably can't see but i'm also by the trees oh how wonderful i live on uh uh, in a little fairy cottage on a horse farm and i'm nestled in trees so in a way we sort of are (laughs) both of us magical ladies sitting by the trees This is great. I I will quickly read your bio from the book, and then we're just going to get right down to it and have a magical conversation. Um, So, yes. Okay, but this is is a podcast. It it goes out audio. It does go out audio. Don't worry. Don't worry. It won't. (laughs) Neither of us shall be seen, my dear. Good. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't do that to either of us. And certainly if I did, I would have given you fair warning for Lord's sake. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, so, uh, and so, and this will be on Psychedelic Salon, and it will be your second I know. interview on Psychedelic Salon, and that's because I was almost, I was in, just insistent, <laughs> like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I want my crack at talking to this magical lady, especially after I read your book. So, uh, so, and of course, so you wrote ayahuasca new hope for depression addiction ptsd and anxiety rachel harris phd has been in private practice for 35 years she received a national institutes of health new investigators award has published more than 40 scientific studies in peer-reviewed journals and has worked as a psychological consultant to fortune 500 companies and the united nations she lives on an island off the coast of maine so i have to tell you that I, you know, I, I had this whole sort of thing outlined of what I wanted to cover because I took copious notes. Your book is now one of my treasured gems in my library. With do- I'm one of those people, I dog ear the pages. I, I do, I confess, and I underline stuff. So, and, uh, and I just want to start at the end because you spoke to my heart, and, and this was under the title of, un- of Under Forest Bathing. And, and you wrote, I think Grandmother Ayahuasca traveled from the Amazon rainforest to the Western world to heal us so we can heal the earth. Westerners have been disconnected from our wild roots for so many centuries that we need personal healing to be able to experience, quote, wilderness rapture, an initiation into the world of natural beauty. By falling in love with this enchanted world, we'll realize that we are the caretakers of the earth and we need to heal the environmental crisis we've created. And so I just thought she is speaking my language and this woman loves beauty and loves nature and Mama Aya speaking to you. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely true to me. And and this this is... uh... One of the things that typically changes in people is they become more sensitized to nature and more responsive to nature and more um, committed to caring for nature. And so people often, I mean, people often report moving to um, an environment just like you're in where you're, as you said, nestled in the trees and more connected. As a matter of fact, I, I, there was one week where three or five people talk to me about their need to be in the midst of the trees. It was that specific. Hmm. Hmm. So um, this is really something that's kind of, that sensitizes many of us. Yeah, I, I think of it as Mother Nature is calling her children back. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, saying, dear ones, you have, you have all but forgotten. <laughs> and, yeah. oh, and you used to talk about finding our roots. And then, of course, what do trees have but these? Oh, right, right. <laughs> and that, that quote from Connie Grouds about when she asked, you know, who, she was basically asking, who am I working with? Who is this spirit? And the answer is... The this, unbridled. <laughs> yes. Forces of nature. <laughs> That's how we're going to complete each other's sentences no. for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this sort of feeling of being awestruck in, in, in relationship to these ju- cosmic forces of nature. I mean, we have to... This is so important for us. Yeah. yeah. And for our planet. You know, I think what is happening, I think we're calling the magic back. Oh, that's lovely. (laughs) Yeah. But don't you think, I mean, we have been rendered almost sterile in this Western mindset, which I think really is, I've given quite a lot of thought to this. I think it's like a a commercial construct. So all of a sudden, there is a price on everything. Everything's up for sale. Nature, us, just everything. And, And so with that, we... We lost a very, what was a very intrinsic connection to nature, to the cosmos, you know, to the uh, uh, journey uh, that the planets make. You know, we would, we would farm and plant certain things according to, you know, where the moon was and the constellations. And we, we, and we were in touch with the unseen. And so material science has said, uh uh-uh, no, no, no. We're going to just take this very literally. We're going to break it down to the sum of its parts. And uh, and we've I think we've just sort of gotten lost in in all of that. And yet, you know, the physicists have come back to the unseen worlds. Mm-hmm. So um, 
I don't know. You know, sometimes I'm totally pessimistic and sometimes I'm totally optimistic. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I think perhaps the unseen worlds are calling us in more ways than one. <laughs> yes, and certainly through these plants and fungi. And so, you know, I really, I would love for you to talk about your relationship with Mama Ayahuasca. And, and you know, Rachel, I think what you are doing is such important work because you are really... Um, infusing the whole psychiatric model, psychotherapeutic model with this, a level of beauty of uh, spirit connection that again is really intrinsic in all of us and you are uh, giving it validation and in a really profound way. Well, you know, I've I've had such conflict about what is this voice. I mean, from almost the very beginning, Mm -hmm. from just a few ceremonies, I I literally heard a voice that that I've heard a few times now, but I'd never heard before. I never hear it in any other context. It's it's a very specific voice. And, um, And... and I've had such conflict about what is it. I mean, I'm a Westerner. I, you know, I'm trained in research. And, and you know, there's not much room in my cosmos for hearing a voice that's a spirit entity. And so it's been a real crisis for me to really um, change my worldview. And, and yet, uh, even though I still, I still say I'm in that crisis, I'm, I'm, I sort of hang out in the liminal in the portal between one world and the other, and I'm not comfortable in either world right now. <laughs> but I go, I go back and forth. But when I look back on what have I been doing for the last 10 years, well, I have really dedicated my life to the research study, to the book, to this whole process. So when I look at my actual behavior, I don't seem to have any conflict. Yeah, <laughs> so no. philosophically, I have a conflict, <laughs> not, not in terms of where I've dedicated my energy. Yeah, yeah, I know you are very much a modern medicine woman, and that's what I gravitate to, is the, the medicine women. You are. <laughs> I'm calling it. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> Who, me? And, you know, there's like, I feel like, oh, my God, I hope this is like the last chapter of this. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Again, I'm dedicating myself to supporting the book. And sometimes when people read me a couple of sentences like you did, I think, oh, that's really good. Who wrote that? And I sort of have this odd dis- disidentification with some of the writing. I'm not saying it was channeled. I know I chained myself to the computer. I sat there for hours. Mm-hmm. I know I wrote it. But there is this sense of I'm supporting the book as if it's not my book. It's an unusual experience. And again, I'm totally committed to it. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. And so uh, I think of that as the muse. And Mama Aya, I think, has become <laughs> quite amused. Yeah. <laughs> and amused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I, you know, people ask me, well, what's next? And I have absolutely no clue. And I'm sort of hoping this is the last part of this mission. Um, and I don't know. Mm-hmm. But again, I am doing what's called for. And it's really, it's become like a job that I didn't realize I was signing up for. But I'm I'm as committed as ever. Yeah. So and and I feel so wholeheartedly that um, you know, like I had one client who had had mystical experience since she was a child, and I was seeing her through a really difficult um, uh, divorce. And even with that kind of working with her closely and and being, you know, uh, uh, on her side through such a difficult time, it was a year and a half before she mentioned having a spiritual experience Mm -hmm. as a child, a year and a half before she trusted me Mm -hmm. with that information. And it's because our culture is is so unsupportive of the normal experience of having mystical experiences. We don't know how to categorize them. We don't know how to just respect them and honor them. So it took her that long. I mean, not everybody is that careful, but I understood it. She was afraid I would think she was crazy. Yeah, yeah. You, you discuss that in the, in the book, and I really responded to that. And this is why I'm yeah. saying, Rachel, this is so important what you're doing, because the psychotherapeutic model needs to 
receive this and and really honor it and not overly not intellectualize it either. I mean, you spoke in the book about the importance of being able to go see a therapist when you've had a profound and numer- numinous experience and then run the risk of them just kind of analyzing, intellectualizing it rather right. than seeing it for the experience that it is. And, and, and it's so dismissive. And, and you miss, you, well, you wrote about, you miss an opportunity to, to really cross a threshold into a broader awareness. Right, right. And uh, therapists or well-meaning friends can take something away from an experience. So these experiences are like little little um, plants that are growing. They have to be protected and watered and, and, um, and put in the sunshine. And we don't want uh, a friend or a therapist uh, saying this is just unfinished business when yeah. it's not. And, and yet, like I give the example in the book of this young woman where I was doing what was ostensibly a research interview. And she was talking about her encounter with the divine feminine. And um, I listened to her for quite a while, and, and the divine feminine as an archetype was really inspiring her, and that was very real. And yet, I just could not contain myself, and I said to her, and this is an example of psychologizing spiritual material, and yet it was needed. Mm-hmm. So I said to her, and how's your relationship with your mother? And she burst into tears. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when, when we're in our 20s, she was maybe 27, the, the decade of the 20s is a prime time to work on our family of origin issues. We're a, adults, and yet, you know, we still have, you know, we, we are just coming into our, our full adulthood. It's a good time to work on childhood and, and family of origin. And um, yet her ceremony experience was on both levels. And I, I don't know how to talk about that therapeutically yet for other therapists to know, how to work on both levels without downgrading the archetype. Mm-hmm. And yet she needed to, she needed to, she was on her way home for Thanksgiving when she stopped at my place, and she needed to talk to her mother and begin that process um, of, of, be, of individuation, becoming her own person, and being able to talk to her mother as an adult. Um, but the divine feminine was also there as well. And and helping uh, strengthen her in her um, uh, individuation from her mother. So both are present. We have to respect both. So it's delicate to work at both levels at the same time. Yes, and that is the mark, I think, of a really good therapist, you know, who is working using both your professional uh, faculties and your intuitive functions to intuit ah there is far deeper here (laughs) i this is the time you know to bring that forth i mean that is you know your own wisdom and acuity to see that and and i had a jungian friend point something out to me because i have gone very deeply into the studies of the the divine feminine and i had a troubled relationship with my mother growing up and she's a nice lady i was just you know a rebel and all of that and uh (laughs) and there was a disconnect And she said to me, you know, Shauna, you would not have gone as deeply into these studies if you had had this Mm. perfect relationship with your mother. Oh, beautifully beautifully put. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that that enlarges the whole therapeutic space because it makes that the issues with your mother part of your going so deeply into the archetype. And that's a beautiful way to do it. Yes. And then also I could look back and see how that challenge with my mother served. It served because it sent me into a level of yes. exploration, right? That I just would not have gone into. Right. So, right. so yeah. Um, gosh. Well, that's, you know, that's the, that it, it, what you're saying about the mark of a good therapist is that therapist broadened the field by, by, um, creating a space for both the family of origin work with your mother and the work with the archetype of the divine feminine. And so you get a sense of, oh, yes, I'm all of that. I'm in the midst of all of that. Yes. And and that broadening of the field is so important. 
Yes, because it is both, right? I mean, it, there's it, there's so many layers. It's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And you know, when you were talking earlier earlier about your being in this kind of crisis, I worked with a wonderful teacher named Brew Joy, MD. Oh yeah, and he really changed my my life. He was the master teacher that I found my way to. But one thing uh-huh. he said was, "Crisis awakens." Oh, it awakens. Good. And then another dear friend of mine said, well, Shauna, do you see the Isis in crisis? And of course, by <laughs> Isis, that beautiful archetype of the you know divine mother who's waking us. And, and, and so then yeah. back to Mama Aya, we have this beautiful feminine grandmother, mother archetype. Yes. I hate to even call her an archetype because <clears throat> that feels so, um, you know, limiting, but she is... Well, yeah, it almost speak. feels it, it almost feels too conceptual. Yeah. Um, right. because when I hear a voice, it is so um uh just sort of practical and down to earth. So I don't I don't even feel like it's an archetype for me. Yeah. It's no. just you know, I feel like I'm I'm serving, I'm a good soldier, I'm being called to action, and I just yes, ma'am. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. And so it feels uh, far more practical. It's, you know, I give that example of that young man who, who um, was really disappointed he didn't have a mystical experience with ayahuasca. And he said, but she did talk to me. And I said, well, what did she say? And he said, well, she told me to go home and clean up my room and, and cut my hair. <laughs> well, that's pretty close to what I, you know, I don't get that exactly. But it's that sort of practical, grandmotherly. Yeah. I certainly hope he did it. I mean, I've done what she said. <laughs> yes, yes, I have with the mushroom. That has been my, I've apprenticed myself to the mushroom. Does that feel, what's the gender for you? You know, it's interesting. Uh, the mushroom feels like a portal to me. So I go through and then there are different teachers that are waiting for me. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that's a little different, isn't it? It is. It is. It's definitely different because I've experienced the ayahuasca and I did a few journeys with Aya. And my first two journeys were with two very dear women who, who you know, were carrying this work on. They had apprenticed for a number of years with a, a, a shaman in uh, Peru. And, and uh, so it was an all women's I a ceremony, yeah. but you know, it just came to me. This is not your medicine, and and the mushroom was calling, 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 calling. And so I think also, you know, these plants are working with our DNA. I always joke that your rap doesn't work in in those realms because they can see all of you. So just open your heart and be humble, and you know, let the the yeah, chips fall. Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, Aya has, you know, called to you and so many others. And, you know, for others of us, the mushrooms called and, you know. Right. Right. And have you, in in your being called, have you been uh, called to be exclusive? Uh, to be exclusive with the mushroom? Yes. Uh, not in so many words, but yes, that is. Like, I've tried DMT. Mm-hmm. Ah, nope, not my medicine. Um uh-huh. I think that's the only thing I've explored, really. And so, no, the mushroom, you know. Yeah, it's pretty specific, isn't it? It is. It is. Isn't that so interesting? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you just, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Not belief, because there's a difference. Like, really, this is deep, a deep knowing. Yeah. I just want to say one more thing that sort of surprised me, surprises me about the exclusive nature, because it... Hmm. It kind of uh, snuck up on me um, because I'm I'm a child of the '60s. I mean, I was I was at Esalen in 1968, so that gives you a clue. Um, and so uh, I've been surprised at, at my own personal conservative stance on really only doing this one medicine, mm-hmm. really not doing anything else, and just. And and doing it very as carefully as I do mm-hmm. with only one person who's quite authentic and you know well trained and um, I mean basically grew up in 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 an in indigenous situation. Uh, so I've been surprised how, in a way, narrow and focused I am. It's mm-hmm. sort of caught me by surprise. And as I talk to other people and they're doing other things and. 
and I have no, I just am not called to, you know, I'm really called not to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in a conversation with with, uh, a shaman who was saying it's when he's working with people and they're doing other things, other energies are mixed in. And it's a little more difficult for him in his following with that person. That's exactly right. Do you know... When I first began working with the mushroom, I didn't even start till I was 48. And I, this wasn't planned, but I just kept going back month after month after month. You know, I started with five grams and I just continued. I kept <clears throat> being called and I, I, I started in the forest. My first five or six forays were out yeah. in the forest. In any case, gosh, maybe it was the, okay, that was for a year. And then I would just do it when I was called. And then the second year, I had the opportunity to sit in peyote ceremony with the Native American church, with with a group. And the peyote, right. that was in late May. And in around mid-April, the peyote spoke with me. <laughs> and only you and I would go, okay, yeah, all right. Um, and it said, no mushrooms until I'm done with you. And uh-huh. I understood, yeah, I understood right away. Ah, of course, because, you know, that's like, uh-huh. that's a whole different frequency, mm-hmm. if you will, vibration. Yes. And the peyote is saying, daughter because that's how they speak to me they call me daughter and i think of you as daughter to mama i of course and so saying all right daughter this is you're mine (laughs) for for this period of time there's something that i need to imprint in you for you to carry right yes yes and i have um you have a very uh sweet way of being a daughter and and i i am like a bad teenager Okay. I'm like, oh my God, I hope you don't want anything else. <laughs> is this enough already? <laughs> so it's a very, you know, but I do it. This is just how it is. I mean, it's very, uh, um, I, I don't know what to say. It's a different, but I can sense it's a different kind of relationship. Yeah. And, you know, I would love to be sort of more um, fairy like and spiritual in the whole thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, do I have to do this again? This and I had, you know, there was, I, I think I talk about it in the book where I had uh, a weekend and one one night where I cried for six hours. Mm-hmm. And then the second night I thought, it's got to get better. That's enough crying. I, it's, it's got to be t- picked up exactly where I left off. I cried for a second six hours. And I'm not a crier. Mm. It, at the end of it, <laughs> when I came up for air the next morning, um I had this sense of almost uh, having a co-therapist hmm. in relationship to my own case, you know, my own history, where she kind of confided in me, I, I understand now how, um, how difficult your history is, basically. I mean, I sort of generalized it that way without mm-hmm. going into mm-hmm. A sense of appreciation for... Uh, why some things are not so easily changed. Mm. And I felt like as a therapist, I felt, well, good, thank you. You know, I felt like good, that was <laughs> affirmation. <laughs> I know I had, there's a difficult history there, and I, I know that as a therapist. Um, and I felt like, well, another therapist was acknowledging it. And then I felt also, as the person who cried for two nights straight, it was like, oh, thank God, she really understands. I felt completely understood. So it was, again, these sort of different levels of communication going on. And uh, that was really important to me that I felt, you know, that's sort of high in my book to feel understood. And so for me to feel that she really understood um, was very meaningful to me. And it was kind of a, a relief for why am I not one of those people who changes, you know, in, in a miracle cure? You know, people mm-hmm. are... Have you know, wake up the next morning and they're no longer depressed and they're no longer drinking alcohol and all they want to eat is kale and uh, <laughs> spinach. <laughs> no, I still think about donuts. What is wrong with me? <laughs> oh. So, you know, I haven't been cured yet of my sugar addiction, but I feel that uh, in my therapeutic relationship with Grandmother Ayahuasca, she understands more and she's patient and kind. So then I can be more patient and kind with myself. Ah, yes, good point. You know, you that reminds me of that beautiful story you shared in the book about 
uh, you were working, uh, this was, I don't know, the Harvard area, and there were all these doctors in white coats, and there was this woman who had just, you know, been oh, in and yeah. out of mental hospitals, and this one doctor just looked at her and said, I'm so sorry for your suffering. Right. And, right. and so this feels the same thing, this, this, yeah. this affirmation, this recognition, this being seen, being seen and your sufferings acknowledged. And, and yeah, that, that had to be just so difficult. Like that level, that is a healing. That's yes, a healing. that in itself is the healing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and so then I, ha- then of course, you know, I have to step out of it a little bit and say, well, there's a real therapeutic relationship here with the plant spirit. Right. I mean, now I really, now I really feel a little crazy, but that is actually part of the process. And, uh, you know, uh, there have been times when I've been in conversation with someone where I felt like I really, where they had, they had also ayahuasca in their blood, so to speak. I mean, they also were connected and it almost felt like I had a Mm co-therapist, that it wasn't two people in a conversation. It was three. I felt that grandmother ayahuasca's presence was helping both of us in this conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, you, you know, I, I, I want to talk about this more. I'm, I was just r- writing an abstract for a presentation in the fall, and I want to talk about this. And at the same time, I think, oh, this sounds really weird. <laughs> you know? Yes. Well, this is where I've talked about this. I see our Western conditioning as a hindrance. Yes, yes it is. Absolutely. I see what you're doing. And in my own small way as well, I, th- I think we are reclaiming something that has been lost. And you're doing it in, in, in that world of, uh, you know, the clinical world. Yes. And, and, and you know what comes to me? <laughs> I, I mean, there are good men involved in this also. But in my mind, I think it takes a woman. It takes <laughs> a woman. And uh, because, you know, that you can, you, you know, you're, you can put people sort of... Um, off guard, you know, and just, uh, you know, there's a, there is, there's, the, I know the, the rebel teenager, but there's also, there's a gentleness, there's a tremendous warmth mm-hmm. and a tremendous humanity. And at the same time, it's very clear the level of intelligence and professionalism. In other words, so then, you know, Mama has given Mama Aya your face to this piece. And so people can say, well, gosh, Jeez, I mean, look at Rachel. I mean, if, if this is how Rachel's <laughs> she, talking. And she if, seems to be sane. <laughs> right, right, right. But if she's in touch with this, then maybe I'm not so, you know, crazy. Maybe this is something I really need to delve more deeply rather than, you know, dismiss or hide or, or whatever. So, you know, you're doing a service on so many levels. You know, that as well. For someone to actually really maybe... You know, go back to, all right, I need to look at this more deeply. You know, there's more to this than I have have deemed, you know, or mm-hmm. to just know that, okay, God, thank God, I'm not crazy. I mean, look at this. Yes, this yes, woman. for sure. For sure, yes. You know, in my book, I talk about um, searching for therapists, working with people mm-hmm. who are in and out of ceremonies. And um, I finally found one woman, a, a, again, a wise woman, basically, who said, you're asking the wrong question. It's not how do therapists work with people drinking ayahuasca. It's, um, it's uh, has the therapist connected with ayahuasca herself? Mm. And how does that change what she does? It's from within the therapist that it opens the doors. So, you know, there's always that question, does a therapist have to um, have experienced ayahuasca himself or herself? And, you know, I hate to be sort of dogmatic about it. Oh, yes, they absolutely have to. Mm-hmm. It helps a lot. I mean, I, I sort of squeak out of this question by saying they have to be familiar with their inner worlds. And there are many different ways of doing that. So I kind of want to leave that door open. But Grandmother Ayahuasca is so specific. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. You know, I think to myself, well, what if... So, what if um, Somebody came to me who was working so deeply with mushrooms the way you are. Would my experience with Grandmother Ayahuasca open the door for me to work with that person? You know, there would be a difference. I would be limited in some ways. A difference. Yes, I agree there would be a difference. 
and you would get the deeper meanings. But I wouldn't be connected in the same way. There's an energetic connection that happens. Okay, and though the conversation could still occur in terms of the yes. connection with the spirits, the voice, the inner voice, all of that, you you are no stranger to. And so, right. so there could still be a very in-depth and important dialogue that would occur. And I think that's the bottom line there is that they can speak with someone who, you know, you know the language they are speaking. Yes, you're in connection with a, a different intelligence, shall we say. But, but right. still, That's, they, you know, in other words, they can speak yeah. freely and safely, and you can hold that space. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. So that opens, that, that uh, goes to the possibility if someone has traveled in these realms, then that's... Uh, that's then it's safe enough. And I still maintain there's a subtle difference, that there is still a difference. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you know what threw me? There was, uh, I talk in the book about this Swiss psychiatrist who was doing groups with a whole slew of different um, medicines and drugs, mm -hmm. psychedelic mm -hmm. drugs. And she would take them too in the ceremonies. Did you notice that in the book? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I thought, well, I don't have to be drinking ayahuasca to do to to connect. And I was just I came. I, there's a place where I came out pretty strong by saying, you know, we have to be able to know how to travel in these inner realms uh, with or without the medicine. And I I love when the um, the shamans say, if you really know the teacher of the plant, you don't even need to drink the medicine. And so there's an energetic connection that mm -hmm. happens, and mm -hmm. and uh, I I really wanted to take a strong stand that in therapy, the therapist can connect without without being in that state. Absolutely, yeah. Because I have yeah. my own therapy practice, and oh my yes. god, I don't do the mush. You can't. Or my god, right. are you kidding me? <laughs> no, yes, no. Exactly. And I didn't want that to be a model. Is there? Yeah. There are not that many people writing about therapy with different entheogens. And I didn't, because there's so little written, I didn't mm -hmm. want that to be a model. I wanted to come out against that. I, I so appreciate that you did that in the book. If, and uh, listeners out there who, you know, who have not read the book, please do yourself a favor and, and read this book. Because you, you did this, like you said, it's not dogmatic. But at the same time, we have to have some kind of principles. We have to have some kind of foundation, you know. Um, I, I, I talk about how the early, you know, uh, mystery schools and priest and priestess hoods, they had maxims. They had principles. Uh, and they uh -huh. stuck to, you have to, because you're delving deep into the mysteries, into areas of awareness that, you know, the general folk don't have and there's a level of responsibility yes. that goes with that and I think you uh, really covered that beautifully in in the book you spoke to that beautifully with humility but also with authority because this is a big deal this level yeah. of exploration it's a big deal you you know there's people with tremendous trauma they're dealing with all sorts of stuff and so if you're going to work with a practitioner there's just so many people abusing this that 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 position and and you yes. speak of that as well you know in these very sort of casual uh gatherings you know some some of which are you know just wonderful and held with you know tremendous reverence and and uh, others that are not so much like this story you talk about uh some reporter for the new york times or something ended um, up in brooklyn or something the, the, over a bar the new, the new yorker magazine <laughs> okay. which you know, I'm a big fan of. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunate, to say the least. Right. Nowhere are we supposed to be hearing sounds from a bar. <laughs> no, it's not supposed to be like that. <laughs> no. Well, um, I think this is a very, very important piece. That, that there has to be some kind of, you know, established go-to, some established format, some, you know, principles around this, you know, that we adhere to. And it's quite and it's quite difficult to um, describe this level of work. Uh -huh. 
And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I interviewed uh, a president of a Jungian Institute at one of the major cities around the country. And he, and he was familiar with different medicines. And he said he organized a group of Jungian analysts to have an ayahuasca experience, mm-hmm. an authentic ayahuasca. And he said they, could, <laughs> they didn't do too well. <laughs> mm. They were terrified. Wow. Uh, and so I think, well, you know, that kind of disappointed me a little bit. I thought, well, Jungian analysts should be able to do, they should, uh, my expectation, you hear my should in this, mm. I would have thought that they would be able to travel in these realms. But no, they were more intellectual than experiential, and they had a great deal of trouble mm. and never returned to, the, you know, another ceremony. That was really? For them. Yeah, that was it. And um, huh. I spoke to a friend of mine who is a, a Jungian analyst, and she wasn't at all surprised. So she was more sophisticated than I was mm. in, in knowing the limitations. So it's very, you know, this kind of work is so much dependent upon who we are and the work we've done mm-hmm. and the inner right. travels that we've done. Mm-hmm. And so it's in some ways it's very difficult to talk about, well, what does this process look like? And I thought, well, you know, it would be great to have different therapy stories of an unfolding process over time. Mm -hmm. And I've been wanting to make a distinction within the the community, but everybody now is talking about integration. There's a a great deal of interest in integration. And, yeah, I'm interested in integration, but I'm really interested in ongoing therapy. And integration is a part of ongoing therapy, but ongoing therapy is much bigger. And so I'm really wondering, well, what what would those case studies look like? What does it look like when someone is in and out of ceremony and in that kind of um, container of a therapeutic relationship? And what does this look like after a year or two? Hmm. And and that's kind of my focus now of, well, who who's doing that and, and what does that look like? And it's going to look very different with different therapists and different people. And then and then somebody said to me, well, we don't, you know, this is, um, this is underground therapy. Maybe we shouldn't highlight it right now. <laughs> and so, you know, there's that question as well. And yet people are doing it. And so it, these are very delicate areas. And I, I don't know yet what I'm called to do or what, but uh, these are very interesting questions. How to handle this emerging um, uh, opportunity. Yeah, I just think of Brew, my teacher's words, more to be revealed. More yes, to be revealed. Exactly. <laughs> people working in this ways. I mean, this is part, I'm sure this is part of why we wanted to talk to each other <laughs> is because we knew we share this kind of perspective. And, and often we're working sort of quietly and oh, yes. in a, more of an isolated way. It's mm-hmm. not like we're going to go to a, a regular supervision group no. and share what we're doing. So, mm-hmm. so it's, it's more private. Mm-hmm. 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 But you know what? That feels almost more in alignment with this level of work. You know, that it's often done, just close my door, this is often done in the quiet of night. That it's naturally quiet. Yes, yeah. yes, or within groves of trees or at the kitchen table of a good medicine woman or a medicine man, you know, or you're in their hut or whatever, you know, yeah. and, and that's how, that's how it's in that it's intimate, done. Yes, yeah, it's, that intimate space. Thank yeah. you for that. Yes, it's deeply intimate. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, I, I do mostly now, I mean, I work with one-on-one clients, but then I do one-on-one retreats, and then I just wow. had, a, yeah, and I just had a couple come last week, and they stay for, you know, four days in my home. And oh so, my goodness! I know, I know, but you know, I just, I, 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 you know, call in certain people, but oh my God, Rachel, it's deeply intimate, and it could not be yeah. done, you know, in a different context. You know, I have no interest in the big group. You know, so it's, uh, it's very rich, and uh, yeah, and and then you can go very, very deep with someone. You know, I sort of, you know, I, I open and make myself. Uh, not so much 
Well, I guess vulnerable in that there's that transparency. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And so then the other person feels, all right, gosh, look what she's opening. OK, I feel comfortable. I can do this. Right. Ah, well, let's talk about allies, too. I mean, so clearly Mama Ayahuasca is your, your ally, your guide, your teacher, your partner, <laughs> your business partner. Yes. <laughs> Your personal assistant. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's not exactly a business. It's more like I donate to her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, so she seems to be the primary, you know, because um, we, you hear talk of, you know, tutelary spirits in the form of animals and whatnot. So for me, you know, I have the owl as well as the, you know, the fae. And so... Well, just simply that, you know, yeah. those beings enter into that very intimate piece that you share with your client, you know, whatever the situation is. Do you do you have a sense of, of other tutelary spirits with you? Well, let me, let me just first clarify that I've retired. I retired my private practice. Oh, so I, I, I admire. Figured. Yes, right, right. And, and I moved to my little cabin uh, on this remote I'm on the remote side of a remote island uh-huh. off the coast of Spain and so <laughs> eagles fly by yeah. you know there are eagles nesting at the at the end I'm on a pond across the street from the ocean so this is a fresh and it's called a pond but it's a mile long it's really a lake yeah. and um, there are eagles nesting at the north end of the pond and so you know, I see the eaglets as they begin to fly, and, and I see the eagles when they hunt the seagulls because they will take them down right out of the air. And I've seen, <laughs> there was one summer, I, I said to one of the locals who are very good naturalists, I said, to, I said, I saw two eagles over the pond and they were fighting. And he looked at me <laughs> and he waited. <laughs> and I said, yes, and they were, they engaged and they were, uh, kind of fighting, you know, tooth and nail hooked together, and they were, you know, coming straight down, and then like three feet from the water of the pond, they disengaged, and each of them flew away. And he looked at me, and he said, they were having sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and I had never seen eagles having sex. Wow. And it's pretty wild, you know, they really, they went straight down for wow. hundreds of feet, because they started pretty high. So I live with the eagles, and I live with these big boulders that I know have a consciousness. And, um, you know, it's been, it's, it's what I'm most grateful for in my life, is living in the, in the wilderness and in this silence, mm. and so close to nature. Mm. And so I have a lot of help just living where I am. But nobody speaks to me the way, you know, the way I, I don't yeah, hear another yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's no question I'm soothed and restored mm-hmm. um, just being on this island. And there's a, there's a community here. And, um, you know, half the community hates the other half. Oh, really? You know, this is not an idyllic place. This is more like you know, the, the, with the McCoys and the... The Hatfields I, and the McCoys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, who's not talking to whom recently? And so this is not a peaceful, idyllic place, but it's loads of fun and mm. interesting. Mm. But the only thing we all agree on is the, to protect nature here, mm. to protect the island. Everybody has their relationship to what we call the island. Ah. And, it's, and that's the personification, the island. Mm. And um, you know, every every dinner party eventually gets around to talking about the island and what's best for the island. Wow! wow that's <laughs> and beautiful. so there's this shared sense of a of a presence. Wow! Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, a few a few um, things. So first of all, it's just so it's so lovely that you live there, and it also cracks me up at the same time, Rachel. Because okay, you're on this remote island, and you're just all you know, and you're retired, yeah. and, I, and that's why I was laughing. Is it's like Mama I is like, um, well, yes, and dear, <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you know, not, once we're here, none of us want to leave, and I've made the commitment: I will leave at any time. I will do whatever is necessary. I'll mm. I'll go give a talk. You know, I. 
I'm so, uh, you know, it's a 40 minute boat ride to the mainland. It's not a, it's not a ferry. It's wow. a mail boat. Wow. Um, so I have a car on the mainland. I'm, I'm 10 hours to Manhattan. So I said to someone in Manhattan who's organizing things, I said, I'll come down. Well, that's a two day trip down. Wow. <laughs> And, um, but, you know, I'm willing to do that. Whatever it takes, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's my commitment for this year. Wow. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> that's impressive. So, yeah, because I could see why you'd want to be all curled up in that gorgeous space you are in. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And, and it's also incredibly restorative. And I think very important also for the work that you're doing, like quite a gift, you know, yes. that you yes. have this little nest on this island. You know, and so so I could see that really nourishing you. And then you go out into the world when you're called and you do this extraordinary work. And then the eagle piece is really interesting just because it feels to me, you know, on a different mystical level, like, ah, she's bird tribe. Of course she is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I have been receiving these beautiful poetic messages as a result of doing the mushroom and uh, come to find out that the original shamans were the poets and that of course these oh, medicines sure. yeah they were associated with right. you know the poetic inspiration right. but when you were speaking about that eagle and i thought i thought of you know this incredible connection you have to mama aya and and the space within yourself essentially that you have found and in one of the poetic messages that i received they said it takes wings to find this uh, place, a right. bird's eye view, you know, right. to see, and and and, uh, and and a bird's eye view is you can see the below and you can see the above, you know, and you can navigate both, you know, and that's really what you are doing because, you know, you've got your navigating, you know, the clinical, well, you're, gosh, it's like you're really marrying the two hemispheres of the brain. You know, and you say you stay in that sort of middle liminal sort of space in between, right. you know, I would say you are navigating that space brilliantly. You're straddling both worlds, you know, and to the alchemist, you failed if you're just stuck in one world, you know, I mean, you are navigating both. You're really holding the tension of those opposites. But I'm, I am, I am trying to hold the tension of the <laughs> okay. and, and to become more comfortable in not knowing. Mm. But the truth is more like I feel completely um, pulled in one direction or another. Mm. So if somebody says to me, like in this conversation, oh yes, we'll talk about grandmother ayahuasca. But if somebody comes up to me after a talk, like someone did a few weeks ago, and says, you know, from a Buddhist point of view. You're, you're, everything is a projection. You're co-creating this grandmother ayahuasca voice. Hmm. I'm like, oh, yes, of course, that's true, too. Mm. And I lose it completely. <laughs> I have no concrete sense of reality anymore. I mean, I just have to face it. I just don't know. And so I can easily get pulled to one side or another mm. of this uh, portal. Huh. And um, so I don't feel so much like I'm balancing beautifully in between. I feel like I get dragged one way and dragged <laughs> another. And, and I just am working on accepting and becoming more comfortable in the mystery. That's, that's kind of what I'm sort of actively working on in my own inner acceptance. I, I want to say something about what you said about the eagle point of view mm. and that sense of that a, a, a a broader viewpoint is one of the interesting things that happens uh, with people is even if uh, I've had, you, you know, there are those miracle cures where someone wakes up and says, oh, I'm never, I'm, I haven't been depressed in years mm -hmm. after one ayahuasca yeah. ceremony. Why not me? You know, <laughs> but um, you know, it's a miracle cure, but other people say, well, I still suffer with anxiety, depression, but I have, a, a healthier distance from it. So I know it's arising and it will pass. Mm -hmm. And I don't get stuck in it like I used to. And I don't layer on top of it like, oh, why am I so depressed? Mm -hmm. Or um, what, you know, will I ever get through this? You know, I don't layer the worry on top of it. So the, there's such a wonderful therapeutic distance that people have. And I remember talking to this one guy who is very clear in just, you know, brief interviews that he really suffered with anxiety. 
but he was able to almost have a sense of humor about it. Well, no, that hasn't changed all that much, except I have a better attitude toward my anxiety. Mm. So that's a, that's a fascinating shift that happens. That I, you know, The closest I came to it, seeing it in psychotherapy, is I had a, a yoga teacher who started Prozac, and she would be able to say, well, now that I'm on Prozac, there's sometimes I say to myself, I should use my Prozac mind to think about this. And so she was able to make that distinction between how she functioned without Prozac and how she could see things with the help of Prozac. Hmm. And so th- there's something very functional about that for sure. And it's, um, it's sort of, you know, if we're not going to have a miracle cure, if we're not going to be one of those lucky ones, then this is kind of the next, the next step that helps helps us live with what we have, with what we're dealt with in a way. Whatever our biochemistry is or our situation, it helps us live with with the life we have right now. Something else that I loved in the book that you talked about is that shattering, that necessity, that the death and rebirth uh, piece of, 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 of that part of the ego that has to, you know, sort of, be broken down or shattered so that this new peace can come forth. But that really spoke to me as well, because that's so shamanic, that death and rebirth. You know? Absolutely. Yes. So here's something I want to talk about. You know, in the, in the research coming out of Hopkins, they're basically saying the therapeutic variable is the complete mystical experience. So it's, you know, that, um, ex- you know, where, where your sense of an, it, being an individual disappears and you're, you experience unity and it's ecstatic, complete mystical experience. And it's ineffable. Hmm. It's very difficult to describe. And that's what they're most interested in. And so they're identifying what's the, what's the best dosage that is most likely to lead to that complete mystical experience. And that's what leads to... Um, reduced anxiety about uh, having terminal cancer, or it enables people to stop smoking, which is a very difficult addiction to stop. Mm -hmm. That's what the therapeutic variable is. And then I I try and say, well, that's their their, uh, model for how therapy works with psychedelics. And then I put that on ayahuasca, and it doesn't fit at all. Because um, some people have mystical experiences with ayahuasca, Mm -hmm. and some people... We live childhood traumas. Right. And both are therapeutic, and mm-hmm. there's this much wider range. And so this is where people have death experiences, but where there's a shattering, but it's not necessarily a complete mystical experience. Um, there are different, all kinds of shamanic experiences they have. So there's this much wider range, and, um, and yet they're incredibly therapeutic. So I, I hope... For the convenience of research studies, we don't limit our concept of what's therapeutic about these medicines into one simple variable of a complete mystical experience. It's far more complicated than that. And also, um, you, you, when you describe therapy, you have this lovely sense of a journey and an unfolding and uh, curiosity about how that process is going to happen it's not just a one-shot deal and so there's that sense of ongoing work Mm -hmm. and process Mm -hmm. and involvement and i don't want us to lose that in in the 50s and 60s in europe when they were working with lsd assisted therapy they called it psycholytic Mm -hmm. you know that term Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep so it's the distinction between psycholytic and psychedelic and the psycholytic was the lower dose People could even talk during uh, a psycholytic dose of LSD. They weren't um, so blown away that they couldn't communicate. So, but it was still LSD-assisted psychotherapy. They didn't take it every time, but it was an ongoing, which is how MAPS is using MDMA in their ongoing study of um, PTSD. Mm. And they say it's, it's MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So the emphasis on the psychotherapy, even though the psychotherapy covers three to four months, it's Mm. still Mm short-term. But the research with psychedelics is very much one or two experiences, and then you're supposed to be 
cured, basically. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of, you know, on a little bit of a crusade here, wanting us to remember the psycholytic process and how this framework doesn't really work for ayahuasca, and there's more of a process that can continue over time. And I've, I've watched people um, just working with ayahuasca over time, with no therapy, mm-hmm. and I've watched them change and grow and become more self-confident, more whole, more themselves. I've seen, you know, very, um, you know, like... Uh, sort of um, wispy women become stronger and more mm. grounded and mm-hmm. more, you know, more rooted and strong. Yeah. And, and you know, I've seen all kinds of changes just with ceremonies themselves and no psychotherapy. Mm. So there's a process that can unfold. And I just, I, I want to be clear that it's really not just about a complete mystical experience. And that sometimes happens. Yes. Yeah, well, I just, I look to nature for my cues because, you know, we are nature and nature works in cycles and, in and, and cycles. she takes her time and it's a process and she'll get the job done, but it, it's over time, you know, and it's in layers and uh, yeah, it's not this sort of one, you know, one shot or one magic pill, which I think is, you know, Right, the danger, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, people seem to be quite enamored of that in this culture. And it's like, you know, it just doesn't work that way. It's not like you do a workshop over the weekend and now you're a shaman or whatever, you know. I mean, this is. <laughs> There's a training program. You can become a shaman in six weeks. Oh, really? It's, yeah, <laughs> it's a retreat center in Peru, just in case you're interested. <laughs> oh, okay, good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yes, that's it. Exactly. So I want I want um, more vo- more voice for this other process of unfolding mm. and the concept of layers and and working through and that it is a process. Yeah, yeah, it's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah, I, I don't want us to lose that. Uh, and I understand that's that's impossible to research what we're describing. It's it it costs too much. It takes too long. Yeah. There's no way to standardize the treatment. Or institutionalize it, for goodness sake. You know, well, thank God. Thank God, I say. (laughs) You know, the mushroom said to me once, I am that which will not be legitimized. I am that which will not be civilized. I am a mystery. Oh, wow. (laughs) Oh, you're getting more poetry than I get. (laughs) Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I just never forgot that. You know, it's so true. no. I don't have anything on that medicine. You know what I mean? Like it is a mystery. I serve, yeah. I serve those teachers with great humility, but I, you know, I, it, it is a mystery. It is a mystery and it's ancient. I always joke, which came first, the mushroom or the shaman <laughs> or the ayahuasca <laughs> or the shaman? <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, what we're talking about here, I think these are the original teachers and the ancients learned from them. You know, yes, yes, that is really what they say. Yeah. And so, you know, Western culture, you know, there's there's a hubris that goes along with this culture to think that they can. uh, Oh, dare I say Trump uh, it (laughs) (laughs) and uh, and uh, and think that, you know, they can, you know, hack it essentially. And and then and then, okay, here we've we've got the magic piece. Here's the formula. We've got the formula. And yet they're also missing the uh, understanding that each of us is wired so differently. We may look the same, but there is a maxim of law. I studied a little bit of that that says what is like is not the same for nothing similar is the same. We're all you well know this, right? We're so unique. And so you there's no magic formula that you can give the same formula to each person. And they're going to have the same experience. It's impossible. And so I think there are some things that are just going to have to remain a mystery. (laughs) (laughs) And can we live with that? (laughs) Well, that's that's exactly what I work on in Mm. my own inner life. That is what I'm working on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, With these probing, curious minds of ours, you know, (laughs) we have to know. I I know that. (laughs) I always joke and say, I just want to know everything. That's all. That's all. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and 
I hear the mushroom spirits laughing, you know, in the background. Oh, Shauna, there she goes again. <laughs> you know, do you, do you communicate, do you hear from them all the time? In and out of ceremony? Of course, yes. Well, that's what blew my mind with the poetry because after a, a time, you know, I would do the mushrooms and I would just, because I go into a kind of mediumship, but then I was just speaking in poetry the way you and I are speaking, no editing, full rhyme. And, and then that was happening uh, as of last August. Uh, and I went to Scotland and on the plane to the Isle of Lewis, where I was going to be going into ancient stone circles, I had my pen and, and uh, journal, and the beings started speaking to me. I call them beings. And it gave me a whole, it spoke in poetry, and it said, the gates you'll stand before, meaning the stone circles, will open, and that you hold the key in you. And I understood that that key I hold in me is I've opened up a pathway as a result of all that deep work with the mm -hmm. mushroom. And then Rachel, oh my God, poetry was just pouring forth. And then mostly it would happen as I was waking in the morning and I came home and they said, well, you know, we've come with you, dear. We're your new mentors. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and so as I was waking, this poetic message would come through. So I was bringing to bed with me a digital recorder. Now, of course, right. people in your profession would call me loop-de-loop, -loop, but you and I know better you know, that, that we've touched on something, you know, that is right. a mystery and these exquisite messages would come through. And then, you know what? It stopped as suddenly as it started. It stopped after a couple uh -huh. of months. And that resulted in a book I put out called Poetic Whispers from the Green Realms. And I love that you spoke to that green yeah. mystery at the end of yeah. your book. Truly, Rachel's yeah. just like, oh, God, this woman's a sister. You know, I just can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew when I found you on the internet, I knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll send you the book. And I did an audio oh, recording thank as well. You. I love it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you will. It'll speak to you. So, yeah, so that to me is so, yes, the mushroom does come and speak. And then, certainly, when I do therapy sessions with people, yes, uh, you get help. Yes, I get help. Mm -hmm. There's a presence there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so. Again, though, you know, this is ancient. This is not new. There's nothing new about this. We're modern folk, and, and we're, we're simply reclaiming something that's very ancient, and, and we're, we're navigating how do we bring this into a 21st century construct, you know, and how do we do this gracefully and carefully and respectfully and intelligently? Yes. And, and, you know, here you are, just this uh, a very important example of how that gets done. You know, I mean, I really cannot thank you enough, Rachel, for this good work you're doing. And, and I thank you for your courage and your spunk and, um, <laughs> and everything that goes along with it. You know, that takes ovaries, girlfriend, you know, really. You know? <laughs> I still have them. They're not doing much, but I still have them. You know, a book that was really important for me was um, When God Talks Back. Hmm. It's um, an anthropologist who did an, a, a participant ob observer study by going into a landmark church. I think this is a, 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 there are a bunch of churches across the United States that are part of this landmark church. They're evangelical. Okay. And they train they train their members. They, their members are in prayer, small group prayer circles, and they learn to recognize uh, the voice of Jesus, the voice of God. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Oh, I'd love <laughs> to be a fly on the wall for that. <laughs> well, that's what she was. That's ah. literally what she was. And in her book, she describes this. And, uh, you know, the question I have, of course, is, is that any different than what we're talking about? Mm. And I mean, this is, you know, pretty alien to me, really. I'm much more comfortable with a, a boulder talking to me than um, Jesus. And, uh, and the people, it takes about six months, and people are supported in the process of, of having coffee with Jesus every morning. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, hey, there's well, many paths, right? 
Yes. And um, how do we discern what's what this means or how, is this legitimate? It, mm. I, I mean, I, I don't know. And so the only thing I have known to fall back on in terms of discernment, because this is not, this is pretty alien to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, this kind of evangelical mm-hmm. having coffee with Jesus every morning mm-hmm. um, is, you know, do these people then uh, behave better in the world? <laughs> well, I was going to say this, that merits a study, Rachel. Are they more <laughs> ethical? Mm-hmm. Are they kinder? Yeah. Uh are they um, more loving? Mm. And so that's the only, uh, that I retreat to those questions ultimately. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it was, uh, you know, Houston Smith in the 60s who said a religious experience does not make a, a spiritual life. And we have lots of bad examples of yes, spiritual do. leaders not having, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know mm-hmm. ethical lives. And and so I, I kind of want to in, include this in our conversation as well, that there has to be some process of discernment that Absolutely. we're involved in. And this is even more difficult to talk about. Um, well, it makes me think of an old wise saying, Rachel, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, anyone can talk a good game and talk about this experience or whatever this group they're involved in. But yeah, you're exactly right. You know, how are you leading your life? I, I'm always interested as a mother in, you know, well, what are your kids like? You know, I mean, because the kids, <laughs> not always, but they can often, you know, re- reflect the kind of right. parenting that they, rece- they received and, and all of that. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of the inner family life you know how are you running that family you know how are you treating your children and uh you know because they are you know a reflection of that and uh yeah and how are you in your relationships i remember many years ago uh working going on a one of those journeys to the yucatan and and different places you could go you know, with a, with a woman who's an author and she's a channel. And um, and I thought this was very early on in my explorations and I had really projected on her, oh, she's so powerful, right. she's, so, she's so in touch. And she was terribly abusive. Oh, God. I mean, just terribly, really I'm inexcusable. Sorry. Yeah. Well, not to us so much, but to the people who she had, she with, you know, right. worked with at the center and... You know, so only to realize, you know, wow, you know, um, you can touch these liminal places and um, and still be, you know, a real jerk. It actually, you touched them. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. You talked about that in the book as well, that it's actually no guarantee. Yes. No, but it's very, I still have this sort of childlike expectation that people will be um authentic all the way through well integrated and it's not not at all true i i have to tell this one story is the shaman i work with went back to um the jungle to meet with the shaman his godfather shaman who he lived and trained with for decades and the, that shaman is um 106 years old, give or take a year or two, because, you know, they never know when they're born. And I had seen a video of him a couple of years ago, and when he just had, like, a string loincloth on, I mean, it was remarkable that nothing showed, because I looked, because there was movement in the video. <laughs> Somehow he was completely <laughs> covered. But um, that's all he had on. And, he, and so at that time, he was about 103, and he looked fabulous. It was remarkable. But at 106, he's, this is possibly the last visit, and he's getting ready to transition. And so I said to, to the shaman who I know, I said, well, what were the final teachings? What were the last teachings? And he said, well, they were all about um, ethics and love. Ah. I thought, well, that pretty much sums it up. Mm-hmm. What's more important? That's right. That's right. Yeah, and you talk about that in your book. That's how I feel about the mushroom. You know, that's why I I called a book I wrote about my experience, Love and Spirit Medicine, because I said, this is love and spirit medicine. 
That's what this uh-huh. is. It opens your heart. It connects you to spirit. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, it does. You know, if, if, if well, you know, you also talk about these people who, a couple of these folks who just fought the medicine, essentially. That one fellow who was like, no, I'm going to yes. keep my shit together, essentially, through this right. thing. And he, right. he gained nothing. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, there, there is that. There is that as well. But, but ultimately, yeah, this is love. It's about opening the heart. Yeah, yeah. Could you speak a little bit to that before we end? Because Well, you know, I, I had a humbling experience just a few weeks ago. And this, this 60-something guy was talking about, um, he basically has a lifetime of being a player with women. Hmm. And, you know... I'm sort of trying to be objective and therapeutic about it, but all right, enough already. And he's been in maybe half a dozen ayahuasca ceremonies. And he's, and I said, well, I hope they're really authentic, good quality. Th-. And he said, oh, yeah, we have a DJ. I'm thinking, a, a DJ? DJ? <laughs> yes. And automatically I'm judgmental and I'm snotty and I'm thinking, a DJ? This guy's a player with women. I mean, now I really don't know what to say. And then he started saying, and what I feel is happening is that my heart is opening and I'm seeking more authentic relationships with women. Oh. And I thought, oh my goodness, it is still working. Yeah. It's working despite the situation uh-huh. <laughs> and, the years, and the years of bad behavior. Yeah. And so it's, it's something, it, the movement is still going in the right direction to it. I can feel my heart opening. I can feel I want more authentic relationships. And then I talked with him again, and he said, you know, usually I choose women. This is a brilliant statement. Usually I choose women who are like my mother. <laughs> Narcissistic, and they're cold. Huh. And, um, but, you know, I've started a relationship with a woman who's warm and generous and oh. kind. Loving. And this is the first time I've ever experienced this. Oh, my goodness. I've been dating narcissistic women for four decades, yeah. five decades. I mean, wow. it's, and so all of a sudden he's having a new experience. Mm. And then, uh, and, and still, it is still, you know, the DJ <laughs> with the ayahuasca. And I, I, I said um, something like, well, you know, I hope this gives you a different a new experience that you can then build on. Mm. That this is that this begins to give you a new baseline of what to expect in a healthy, kind, loving relationship. Mm. And he's like, "Yeah, maybe." Oh. I mean, <laughs> and so I have to say, there's there's the kind of unfolding that happens spontaneously with this medicine, despite maybe it's not an ideal situation. And so that was very humbling for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and his heart is um, opening and being healed despite the recorded music, whatever. I didn't even ask what kind of music it is. I didn't want to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. So, you know, something's happening. So the, the medicine works in mysterious ways. Well, and this is such a good point, Rachel, because when you were talking earlier about how it's important that we have some a good set of principles here with how this is structured. But at the same time, we don't want to be dogmatic because no. this is a mystery and, and she really knows what she's doing. Evidently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then I shifted in my relationship to this guy because now all of a sudden, um, I have more compassion for him. Mm. I mean, you have to have compassion for someone who's been dating his pe- women like his mother, like his oh, narcissistic mother for four decades or so. You have to have compassion for someone like that. Yeah. That he's just beginning to learn about what loving, generous behavior and relationship looks and feels like. So it was it was lovely for me to hear his story. And and to rekindle my own faith in this medicine that's, that is that is very mysterious. Yeah, yeah. And she's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> 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 Which the yeah. mushrooms do, too. 
<laughs> and I love that. I love that. Uh, because that to me is high medicine. Humor yeah. is high medicine. We don't laugh enough. <laughs> Really, we don't. And we don't get outrageous enough at times. You know, that just a raucous yeah. laughter that you'll have with people. And it is just... And then, then later, a few days later, you think about it and you start giggling again. It doesn't matter where right. you're... That's, that's fabulous. So good for us. Right. I agree. I, there should be more laughter in therapy sessions. I agree. <laughs> yes, yes. Even that emergency room humor, which is, you know, sometimes required. when It's just yeah, so bad. Sometimes. All you can do is laugh sometimes. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, on that note, on the note, we'll end this on that note of, of laughter. And, and Rachel, I, I'm so happy to make your acquaintance. And, and I would love to stay in touch with you. Well, I'm going to send oh, you absolutely. my poetry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. So thank you from the bottom thank of my you. heart. This yes, is thank great. Thank you. It's been great fun. You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. You know, sometimes when I pick up a book, uh, particularly one written by a PhD, I find it easy to forget that the scholar who wrote it, even though her professional accomplishments far exceed anything that I've ever come close to achieving, well, nonetheless, we can now tell that Rachel is a normal person, just like you and me. Sure, we all have our own unique traits and personalities, but deep down we are all very much the same. For example, I really had to laugh when Shauna and Rachel were also laughing about the fact that even the therapists need their own therapists, <laughs> which reminds me of why I quit practicing law. I really loved law school, and I also enjoyed writing appellate briefs. What I strongly disliked, however, was dealing with clients. <laughs> These people would come to me each day with problem after problem that they were willing to pay me to take care of. What they never knew at the time was that as I was listening to them talk, I wanted to shout out that I was sick and tired of hearing about their lousy problems. If they wanted to see some real problems, then they should look at mine. I had my own damn problems, and, well, I decided that I didn't need to take on any more. So I gave up the practice of law, and Mackinich and Haggerty became simply Mackinich and Associates. But that's another story for another day. While I truly enjoyed listening to Lex Pelger's interview with Rachel, I think that we can probably agree that having the opportunity to listen in on this conversation as well does a lot to humanize Rachel, and really, for me at least, it makes the book even more approachable. At least that's how I feel, and while I've not yet met either of these interesting women in person, I now feel as if I'd known both of them for a long time. I realize that sometimes I talk about little coincidences that take place and stand out for me, but really don't have any meaning for most of our fellow saloners. Well, that doesn't seem to stop me from bringing them up anyway. <laughs> so here's the one for today. Until I heard Rachel mention the fact that Shauna is about to lead a group trip to Ireland, I didn't even know about it. And here's the coincidence. About a week from now, my oldest granddaughter is going to graduate from high school. And for a graduation present, my ex-wife is going to take her on a trip to Ireland, which has a very strong hold on our entire family. So I checked their itinerary in the hope that maybe they could get together, but as it turns out, Shauna and her group are going to be arriving in Ireland on the very same day that my ex-wife and granddaughter will be leaving there to return home. The expression, ships that pass in the night, obviously comes to mind. I wish them all a safe and wonderful experience as they walk on the holy ground, where my heart will always be. Now, I know that I'm talking too much here, but I do want to add a comment about the island life that Rachel spoke about. First, she painted that wonderful picture of two eagles having sex over the water in front of her dream retirement home. And then she said that among the island community, half the people hated the other half. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, I, well, I discovered that it may be more than true. It may be universal to island life. Years ago, when my midlife crisis arrived, I fantasized about relocating to a Caribbean island. So I landed a job as a travel writer for the Rotarian Magazine series on Caribbean island vacations. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> picture me as a Rotarian if you can. <laughs> anyway, uh, over the course of several weeks moving from one island to another, 
I discovered exactly the same situation on almost every island that I visited. The physical settings were perfect, but the society was, uh, well, let's say, less than enjoyable. On each island that I visited for the series, I had to give a talk at the local Rotarian Club. One island, uh, I won't mention which one, but on one island they actually had three Rotarian Clubs that were almost equally far apart from one another. And the bickering about the order in which I was to attend their meetings convinced me that I no longer would harbor any fantasies about moving to an island. Now, before I go, I'd like to make a brief comment about another thing that Shauna and Rachel discussed, and that is the perception of gender in ayahuasca and mushrooms. To be honest, I was really pleasantly surprised when Shauna said that, for her, the mushroom was more of a portal and not necessarily gender-specific, because that's the same way that I experienced the mushroom. As for ayahuasca, everyone that I know who has participated in an ayahuasca ceremony, without exception, experiences that medicine as definitely having a feminine expression. Now, the old cynic in me would say that, well, of course, ayahuasca is going to be perceived in a women's group as being feminine. However, the ayahuasca group that I belong to was made up almost exclusively of men, and we all experienced ayahuasca as having a feminine persona. And not always a gentle one, I should add. She can be a stern mother sometimes, uh, if you know what I mean. And as for having a plant ask you to become exclusive just to them, well, I've had some experience with that as well. While I have had a significant amount of experience with both mushrooms and ayahuasca, well, one time after having what I think of as a deep conversation with both of them, we came to the conclusion that it was time for me to settle on a single plant as my main ally. And so I have. It's neither ayahuasca or mushrooms. My ally is cannabis, and so I have become exclusive to her. That said, we also just heard Rachel say how shamans have told her that once you know the inner landscape, that you don't even need to take the plant to journey there. Well, when I first heard that many years ago, I figured that while such a thing may be true for a shaman, whose life's work involved using the medicine, I just didn't think that it would work for us newcomers to the world of psychedelic plants. However, during the past several years, I've actually surprised myself at how deeply I can get into what I think of as ayahuasca space without actually taking the medicine itself. Granted, uh, I use my ally cannabis when I do this, but after a couple of tokes and some quiet time with my headphones, uh, listening to a recording of some Icaros that were sung at some of the sessions I attended, well, very slowly and quietly, I begin to feel as if I am in a deep forest full of strange sounds. It is night and the humidity is so thick it's close to fog. I don't know how to describe the smell, but I know it well. It's the place that Mother Ayahuasca always takes me to to let me know that I shouldn't worry so much. Everything is going to turn out just fine in the end. So she tells me. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. <laughs>